and what lack of sleep will do to the brain. Okay. I robbed a marker from the, oh, I recorded that. <laughs> I, I am borrowing a marker from the math department, the department that I represent. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, today's topic is not much of this is actually important for the exam, per se, because it's very time consuming. However, the Pearson is, um, oh, we need to talk about this. Okay, I don't like to talk about Pearson's this, but so it's got to happen. I think Pearson is worth as much as a whole exam in the weight of the class. Yeah. So if you think Pearson is the, oh, I don't actually have to do that thing. Um, well, you're going to be the person who has A's on the exams. And they're like, oh, great. I've got the A in the class. And then, bam, two letter grades down because you just didn't do any of the homework. Okay. So, like, do, do the Pearson. I, I think another thing is, I'm teaching this lecture because I need you to be equipped to do the Pearson for this 15.7. Um, and I'll just kind of tell you up front, there's really only one test in here that you're actually going to be tested on in the exam, just because of the way time constraints work. So I have to think of realistically, what can you guys do, you know, literally physically with writing out, but then also mentally in one hour covering a bajillion topics. And when you eventually become calculus professors yourself, you'll realize that that's a very non-trivial decision making process that goes into what's going to accurately represent the important skills that I want you to have as engineers going into engineering classes in the future. If you are math students, I would teach this entirely differently because then I'm going to be emphasizing things in mathematics that would prepare you for future math courses. You're not going into future math courses. The, the road ends here for you, basically, for calculus. So Calc 3 isn't a prereq to anything because you just stop here. You go Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3, that's it. And then sometimes, you know, take linear or whatever. But the idea is um, I'm trying to uh, – I've had the privilege of working with mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, computer engineers, computer um, science for the last four semesters. I see the classes that they're entering. And so the stuff that I'm throwing onto exams is very much catered toward – yeah, if you're going to take something out of a class you paid money for, take this out because that's what you actually do. So, in that case, that does not mean necessarily kick back on this lecture because you still have to do a lab related to it. You still have to do piercing. Um, but don't like freak out that it's a high volume thing because it's not going to be like exam kind of stuff. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So, you'll be able to have your notes in the book and do the homework and stuff. Okay. Another thing that I like about this is it's basically, it. This is the point of the class where people who really put effort and invested into Calc 1 get to reap the benefit, the fruit of their labor now it comes back to help them uh, because it makes this stuff very, very easy. Let's start with the definition. Oh, do you guys know what to do tonight? Lab. Yeah, lab four, um, which is on topics. It's, it's just a bunch of partial derivatives, isn't it? Isn't that one? Yeah. So <laughs> that, that's all it is. So don't procrastinate that, please. Um, so let's talk about max. We're going to talk all about it's basically extra maximums, minimums, but now on things like surfaces, like Pringles, and you know uh, things like that. So a function f has a local maximum value, <clears throat> local maximum value, string of defining, at a point A, B, if F, X, Y, so the function is a less than or equal to F uh, at the point, you guys remember what that upside down capital A is? For all. Yeah, good. So for all points X, Y, in the domain of f, and then in some open disk, in some open disk centered at a b, and then the way that we define local minimum is very similar. Is this going to be? Uh, I'll do it paradoxically. A function f has a local minimum now. 
không có minimum value at a b if f x y is what do you think it's going to be now all the other points now are going to be bigger than because if this is truly a minimum, it needs to be sitting at the bottom. Well, all other points, all other function values will be bigger than are the same thing as the minimum. For all other points x, y in the domain of f, in some open. Interval. <coughs> well, wait, hold on. So I'm open this, really. That's why I'm three dimensional now. So I'm open this. Centered at our point, maybe. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. Um, so basically, I'll write it up here. We're really just talking about local extreme values. So extreme. Value. We use the word extreme to indicate if it's either a maximum or a minimum. So it doesn't distinguish between the two. So extreme value is kind of like, oh, that could be maximums and minimums. Or another word we use from the top one is just a local extrema. So that's the plural. Extrema. So if you see extrema or extreme values, that doesn't mean just the maximums. It doesn't mean just the minimums. It's just any kind of extrema. So both. Uh, the max and the max. And then uh, here's, here's kind of a good way to put it for three dimensions, especially, is that a local maximum, essentially, if you're at your local maximum, you're standing at a point on a surface in which it's impossible to go uphill from there. And that's a good way to think about it. You know you're at the maximum, uh, standing at the maximum point on some surface. And that even accounts for the fact that if there's like a maximum plateau, so if there's a whole plane of maximum values, right? So long as you can't go uphill from where you're at in any direction, you're at a local maximum. So think about it like that. So intuitively, on any surface, um, that works. And then for the minimums, it's the same. It's very, oh, I can turn it into the cheesy. That would be cheesy if I made it biblical, like, the mountains and valleys. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, if you're at the minimum, that means you just can't go downhill. It's impossible to go downhill from where you're at. So if you're at the local max, it's impossible to turn in some direction and go uphill from where you are. And if you're at the local minimum, it's impossible to turn in some direction and then somehow go lower. That's all that is. All right. Let's see. So let's take a look. Oh, recall from Calc 1. So I'll draw, I'll draw a graph because you guys are pretty visual. Which isn't a bad thing, it's just I'm a bad artist, so. OK, so that is a, in Calc 1, we call this, we consider this point for what? Yeah, it's like a little local max here in this surrounding interval. And so one thing that we did was we specifically noted that it just so happens that whenever we are at extrema, what's the derivative? What's zero. Yeah, derivative zero? Because essentially, derivative is slow. And so if you just aren't changing at all, it's zero. At the very top, you're, you're just for a moment, you're not changing. Does this idea necessarily just change all of a sudden if we're drawing a new dimension? No. Now we just have to accommodate, obviously, fx and fy as partial derivatives, but the idea is going to be the same. So here's our theorem. It's going to repeat and expand what you already know about this from Calc 1. If you're at an extrema, your derivative is zero. So naturally, in Calc 3, if you're at an extrema or on a surface now, your derivative, is, right, your partial derivative should be zero. So oh, it's going to be changing. So if f has a local maximum or minimum, at some point a, b, and the partial derivatives f, x, and f, y, if they both exist at that point a, b, that's important. If it doesn't even exist, why bother? Then, as expected, the partial derivative or just think about, now that it's partial, derivative always means change though. 
regardless of that, if it's a regular derivative or a partial. So the change needs to be zero, it needs to be flat. So the partial derivative of x at our point should correspond with the partial derivative of y at our spot, which would be equal to what? Zero. Zero. No change. No change in any direction. Okay, and again, we're recalling, we're recalling this idea that if I have some y is equal to f of x, or x, which is y, this is f, that f prime is zero at this point. So if this was some a, then we have that f prime at a equals zero because this is equal to extrema. Are you able to see kind of Kind of the analog. All we've done is we've thrown one more variable in there and accommodated for two directions for the partial derivatives. The idea is exactly the same though. A derivative of a function being zero, derivatives or changes being zero. So don't don't learn it as separate concepts. Learn it together. It'll reinforce, they reinforce each other. And in a similar way that things reinforce each other, you guys remember critical points from Calc 1. So it's essentially the critical point in Calc 1 was, OK, not only do we double check when the derivative is equal to 0, so our change, when is our change 0, we also checked one more thing. And that one more thing that everyone forgets is sometimes that rate of change can be undefined. So your function could be totally fine. And then when you take the derivative, though, you get some, some weird thing where it's undefined. You also need to investigate those, because those are considered critical points as well. The same exact idea. It, it's there's pretty much absolutely no difference. So when we define critical points now, um, Scott. Yeah. When, so when the uh, derivative is undefined, is that like when it's a sharp point or something like that? Yeah, exactly. So it's like a corner. Yeah. Or a cusp, or exactly. like a, a vertical tangent line that's an undefined. Right? And you still say that the function exists at that point in its continuous. It's just that it can't have a. It doesn't have a proper slope. Yeah. Right. So so think about this one for a second. Here's the function absolute value of x. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to tell you absolute value of x is continuous because mm -hmm. that's correct. Mm -hmm. But we can't, but the derivative suddenly doesn't exist at the origin. Mm -hmm. So the derivative exists all the way over here. The derivative over here is just negative one because that's the slope of that negative line. And then over here on the positive side, we're just regular mm -hmm. y equals x line. So the slope exists from negative infinity all the way up to zero, not including zero, and then from zero all the way up to positive infinity. And so the graph of its derivative is like two flat lines with missing at zero? Yes. And so that's an instance, so we would consider that a critical point. Mm -hmm. okay. And actually, in this case, that critical point leads us to find an extreme value. So that's why we account for them. And it's because sometimes there's extrema that happens at these corners. Oh, circus pants, you know? When you have something like, you know, and it goes around. So this would be like a surface, and it's three dimensional. So the surface head. Well, at this, at the very, very tippy top, technically that derivative, it's not differentiable there. But that doesn't mean that that function value, which does exist, is the very tallest one. So that's kind of a, an extension of this idea from Calc one. That's a good question. Thanks. Anything else on this? So let's let's. Um, get our definition of critical point up on here. So definition and inferior point a comma b in the domain of f is a critical point. Is a critical of our function f if, and there's something that can happen. So I here, again, this is the same as in Calc 1. First things first is if we basically have this condition, right? So if you can show that your partial derivative, your, your change is 0, so your um, fx at ab is the partial fy at ab is 0. So no change, analog to this idea of finding when f prime is zero. And the other thing that could be the case, so or, like we just talked about with the absolute value, sometimes that just rate is undefined. And when it's undefined, if either <laughs> of the partial derivatives are undefined or doesn't exist at that point, check it. It's a critical point. So we would have um, 
at least one of the partial derivatives. So either fx or f1. It doesn't have to be both to necessarily disqualify. So if fx is zero at the point, but then fy is undefined, it's a uh, critical point by, by being undefined. Uh, let's see, fy does not exist. No, does not exist um, at the point. Okay. Questions? Comments, concerns. So to distinguish between our local min max or critical point, we need to see if the point is in the derivative of both partial x and partial y. Yes. You'll want to find fx and fy. And if but here's a nice thing. Then if you get that they're both zero, then you have a critical point. Here's here's a common misapplication of this theorem, though. I want to emphasize this one. So this theorem right here is people will say, oh look. F having some extreme value at a point means that the derivatives are going to be zero. Don't misapply this and flip it around. The converse is what we would call that in logic. It's not true. In other words, just if you had just because you have fx ab and fy ab being zero, that does not go backwards and imply that that's your extrema. If that were the case, we would be making a statement of definition. We've already defined the extreme values. So just make sure you don't make that mistake because it's very easy to do. It's the same reason why people make that mistake in Calc 1 is because we get so used to teaching them f prime is zero, f prime is zero, check f prime is zero, that they think that by automatically finding some a that f prime of a is zero, they automatically assume, oh, that must be the extreme and then they quit. But we know that that's not the case because there can often be multiple points at which you can have um, f prime of whatever being zero uh, and then that can mislead you. So you, you want to make sure you understand a fuller picture. So don't go backwards. So don't say this implies the extrema. Just know that it's the extrema that lets us know about this. The only thing that gets implied is a critical point. So notice how that's how this is defined. So this right here, if you can show this, you don't necessarily show extrema, but you do give a critical point, which puts it on the queue roster, essentially, the waiting list to see if it gets uh, qualified to be an extrema. Okay, is that clear? Is the difference between those two things? That's a pretty whiteboard. Okay. While well, I erase this, um, shout out things that you're pulling out of your Bible reading for the week. <laughs> I mean, it, it probably does feel a little bit strange to comment on minor profits, you know, in math. Uh, but if there's a place for there to be God's judgment and wrath, I guess it's doing calculus three. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what Babylonian is. There's math. You know what I like? Is I think I think the most underrated Bible story that they won't teach you in church is this one. God was so patient with Israel that instead of destroying them for rebelling for as many years as they did, he provided, he basically raised up another nation to kind of give them their spanking. But then at the same time being like, oh, by the way, I'm not just God over Israel punishing Israel. I'm God over basically the entire world. So you took that too far. Now I'm going to spank you with the Parthians. And it's a good time. Uh, <laughs> or no, 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 it's the Persians. I think it was the Romans that got hit by the Parthians. Yeah, Romans got hit by the Parthians. But so. every nation that he raised up to beat the previous nation takes it too far. Yeah. He beats that nation with the new nation. That nation the new so nation. it's just the whole wooden spoon line all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm strongly debating <laughs> uploading this recording yeah, yeah. to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> You know what they should do? You know what they should do for, for instead of having to record the lectures, if it was just like us uh, sitting in a room doing math, mm. it would be, I think it'd be a lot more interesting, but you gotta keep things, what do they say? Professional. Or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've talked about, ooh, so here's finally where we get to do something new and interesting. 
You guys like horses? Yeah. You like riding horses? Oh, yeah. Oh, I thought you meant like blue bags. No, like, like animal, like horses that you ride. And so, what do you put on the horse other than if you don't go bareback? Saddle. Oh, saddle. Okay, so there's this new instance where when you're stuck in Calc 1, you're stuck in the plane. So you can really only, you know, if you derive zero, you can't go in any other direction. You're fixed in a plane. Suddenly, you throw that into three dimensions. And now you've got an infinite number of directions you can point to and see if there's change going on. And so what's going to happen is a saddle point is going to say, hey, I'm confused as to whether or not I'm going uphill or downhill from this point. So, because the saddle, if you think about it, if you go up on certain sides, like the going up the horse, it's going up. Like, so if I pointed in certain directions, I could actually increase from like where I'm standing. But I have to be able to get on the saddle. And so that means if I actually point in this direction from the point I'm going downhill, I'm going simultaneously, depending on which point, I could be going uphill or downhill. Saddle oh, point. You can't get that. So like in Calc 1, you can't be like, hmm, is this going up? or down. You just look at it and say, it's stuck. It's stuck in the plane. There's no way there's only one direction you can go. But now in three dimensions, you can look around 360 degrees, and in the saddle, you can go increase or you can decrease. So we'll discuss what this is. So this is kind of the, the new thing that we get to do in Calc 3. So let F be differentiable. At some critical point, AB. So by saying that AB is critical, we're saying that, okay, either we found that the rates of change are zero, so FX is zero, FY is zero, or it's um, undefined. Either FX or FY is undefined here. It still counts as differentiable even if it is undefined, even if that uh, derivative is undefined. It's a critical point. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then, the function F has a, everyone say it, saddle point. Saddle point. Um, oh, also a good example of saddle point. You guys like eating Pringles? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. saddle point in the middle because you can go up the chip or down the chip depending on certain areas. Um, saddle point, uh, maybe. Wow, my A's are getting really, really <laughs> <laughs> I write, my Greek handwriting puts to shame my English handwriting at this point. So, okay, add A, B, B. <laughs> um, I'm far too dislike for this job. I don't know what, okay. The saddle point at A, B. If, okay, yeah, if. In every open disk. In every open disk centered at A, B. There are points. There are points x, y for which f x y is greater than f of a b, and simultaneously. The function values f x y that are actually less than f a b. So in other words, you could go increasing in one direction, but then pointing in a different direction, now you're going down. Saddle or Pringle or however you want to think about that. I think Pringle point is more fun than saddle. There was one. There was one year I made the mistake of drawing a comparison, and I said, or someone's forehead. And <laughs> so I learned, I learned, wait, wait, what did you say? Well, I'm glad he didn't hear it, actually. Um, <laughs> recording. Okay. <laughs> so, is that, is that okay? With, with this. Wait, Scott. Can yeah. you show us, like, a visual sample? <laughs> <laughs> of someone's forehead? <laughs> or, like, an actual... Okay. I don't know if you're ready to witness this level of art. Let's go, Scott. Okay. Come on, right here. Let me. Right here. I real okay. Real story. I didn't know that if you could, okay, like if you were to close your eyes, like you could see something. Like you can picture in your like an apple or something or a banana or something like that. I was like, I can't do that. So when I stare at this and I'm trying to draw it, I just have to basically think, how on earth? 
am I supposed to draw this? Uh, I'll do my best, but oh God forgive me, so okay. Uh, let's see. <laughs> okay. 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 You know, you know, mm-hmm. this is this is this is resurrectable. I think. Okay, so we got like the thing. <laughs> That's a I don't even want to look at that. It's close. There's like a, there's like a, raise your hand if you can draw. Kobe, come here. Right. What we're going to do. Kobe, you can come here. Do I have an extra marker? Wait, Chloe, you can come. I have a marker for you, Chloe. <laughs> can you draw? Can you draw a saddle, like a saddle? You want the, the saddle? Yeah, I know that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, like that. Yeah, like three dimensions, so like they can see. Oh, shadow. Yeah, that's my How big do you want? Just there, just do it over here. Yeah. And actually, can you guys look? Um, try to draw one. Try to draw one in your notes from the textbook. They've got the, the saddle point. They said you could draw. I have to think about how it looks. <laughs> <laughs> he has to picture it in his head. Oh, he has to picture it in his head. Oh, ooh, that's pretty good. It is Do I have a reference picture? No. Just this draft. You are the reference. This doesn't need to be. The reference. Mm-hmm. We're not putting this in the net. It'll, it'll be okay. You see what I have done. Boom. 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 I forget it. Oh, yeah. there we go. Yeah. That's what I have. It's more of a taco. Like, yeah. Right. Okay. Everyone it's see that? It's more of a taco. Oh, oh. So, yeah. It's a little bit better than the inflated bloated bean that I gave you. Okay. <laughs> it looks like okay. it looks like a tunnel. But yeah. If you if you want to see if you want to see better pictures of saddle points, there is something that I've been encouraging you to read this entire semester. I'm so not this suggesting this that we actually okay. you know saddle point though. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. Now Which here's the exam point. topic. The saddle point is if you sat right there. Uh, you can here, go up this uh, way. You can go up this way. You can go down this way. Up this way. At the very top. Yeah. Or if you came on the Let's inside. See. I don't know how many points I'll make because this, but basically it's going <laughs> down on the sides here. And it's going up. All right. Suppose oh. if you're not handwriting this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I will feel sorry for you when I mark your points off on this section of the exam. Hey, yo. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? You're supposing that all of the second uh, derivatives are continuous. We want them to be continuous so that we can use clear out. Uh, continuous, clear out, through out, and open this. Centered at A B C. Where we have that F X A B and F Y A B and B. What I'm going to show you is the analog to the two. Uh, the second derivative test from Calc 1. So in Calc 1, we extend the idea to a second derivative test where the concavity actually is enough information to let you know whether you've got the max or the min, basically. Because if you know that's your derivative, so if your slope is zero at a point, so you know you're standing at some extreme or something, then you say, okay, now are we concave up, making it a minimum, or are we concave down, making it a max? We can do the same thing with the surface. Only thing is we have a little bit more nuance to accommodate the infinite number of directions we could go. So here's how we do that. We do it with something we call a two by two determinant Hessian maker. You don't need to know the terminology, but um, 
I'll just show you what it is. It's d x y is equal to. So oh, you put f x x up here. You put f x y. So all the x's up here, and then f y x f y y. Do you guys remember how to do a two by two determinant? Mm -hmm. It's basically going to be this times this minus this times this. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to memorize this. If this is easier for you because you did linear algebra, do it. If this one's easier for you just because you can memorize and study, um, do this one. So it'll be f x x um, times f y y minus, and, and now notice f x y and f y x, because we're continuous, they're the same. So I'll just use f x y for the sake of the formula, but we square it because it's multiplied by plus. Make sense? So you will need to memorize this. I won't provide this formula for you on the exam. Thankfully, it's really easy. Because if you just remember that it's a 2 by 2 determinant, you'll know that the relationship is minus between them. And it's nothing crazy. Okay, okay. So here's how this test works. I'll summarize it like this. If you are to compute, so the way this works is after finding your FFXX, blah, 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 right? You plug in your point, and if what spits out is positive, so if the D, this determinant, if it's positive, then you revert to the same, it's, it's almost completely analogous to calc one. So being concave down is going to be its maximum, concave up, minimum. So if your D ends up being positive, then just think back to calc one, how the second uh, derivative will work. And if it's negative, we'll, we'll get to other cases. So if we have the, oh, well, I, I'll use a specific point now so that to clarify. So, if I have specifically an AB, the DAB, if that's positive, positive uh, indicates, okay, we're just going to use um, calc one. And, and so if the second derivative with respect to X, if this is at our point and it's negative, well, we say, okay, so it's concave down, second derivative, negative, concave down. And if you're concave down, maximum. So this tells you that um, you have a local max at a a b. Make sense? So concave down means that tippity top is going to be a max. And so the second case is just to continue so it's D A B is still positive, right? Then that means we can use calc one intuition. So now, if instead of the second derivative being negative, it's positive, positive, or concave up now, so that's going to be a minimum. So this tells us that we have a local min at the point A. Okay, so thumbs up if that's good, if you remember this. So, so far, this is just completely reviewing calc one. <clears throat> and then we accommodate for the fact that there's two other possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be positive, it could be negative. So if you get D, you plug in your point AB, and after you compute all that, you get negative. Oh, this is where we get saddle point. So that means you got a saddle point. So this critical point that you found actually isn't either a maximum or a minimum. It's a point. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because in order for this to be negative, that means the fxy squared needs to be greater than the fxx fyy. So it's competing with um, the magnitudes of your components in the x and y direction. And the very last, what's the last case we need to account for? Yeah, so if you plug it in and you get zero, it's kind of a troll. This is inconclusive. It actually means nothing. So you can't reach any conclusion about the extra. You just say inconclusive. This in no way has any kind of weight on saying whether or not AB is actually extra or not. The force is just, just the inconclusive. So the same way, 
that before you apply L'Hopital's rule, you get an indeterminate form zero over zero. That zero over zero is inconclusive. It doesn't mean anything. But it doesn't mean that the limit necessarily doesn't exist. We just have to try something else. So we don't worry about that in this class. But just know that if you get zero, which it's probably not going to be, um, it'll just be inconclusive. OK, thumbs up, if that makes sense. So here's how you study. I, I get questions like this. How do I study for math? Well, here's how you can do it. Uh, you've been given a new formula, and you've been given a series of conditions. So I would say, practically, the first phase is the computational phase. I just got to compute my stuff. And then the second phase is interpreting. You see how this is broken up? So all this before the list is the computation and then after you compute, you interpret. So the first thing you'll want to do is you'll want to find your partial derivatives. Well, guess what? You can't find the second derivative if you don't find the first derivative. So your algorithm could look something like this. You take your function, and then you want to find the, the regular, right, f, f, and f, y. Start somewhere. And then you did that so that you could find, so you did that, this motivates finding your, all of your second derivatives. Notice that we don't need yx, because x, y, and yx are going to be the same for the intensive purposes of this class, because we're continuous. And then we did this for the sole reason of getting d. Okay. So, And then you'll be given a point. And so we're finding all of this information because we have a critical point. I will give you a critical point. So this won't be something where it's like you've got to find the critical point in the first place. That's going to take too long. I just want to make sure you know how to do this. Um, so then we do that. And then this is kind of like the next phase of the problem, right? So your first phase is constructing this. And now the next phase is just plug in the chugging. So plug in your point, B, A, B. And then say, OK, equal to what? So is this going to be positive? Is this going to be negative? It's going to be 0. And so then we do this to motivate the very last step to interpret. So uh, interpret, um, interpret, um, So if you get a positive d, the very first thing you're looking at is then your fxx. And you say, OK, when I was plugging it up earlier, was that fxx positive or was it negative? But it's inconvenient. You get either conclusion, depending on which one. If you get negative, you don't even you don't have to look further. You just stop and say, set a point. Zero is kind of the frustrating one because you do all this work just to have an inconclusive test. So for your mental sanity, just don't worry about I won't make you simplify something to zero. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's just obnoxious. So yeah, don't worry about that. Um, yes, that, that, well, that's why I'm, I'm teaching it to you because you need to know it for the homework. You need to know it for Pearson. I think there's a lab question. Um, but yes, it'll, so basically know one, two, and three. But do you see how I did that? That wasn't rocket science. That was basically just taking when I say read the boxes in the textbook, this is literally copy and pasted just the box. I've taken the box, I've presented it to you, and then I've interpreted a reasonable way to use the tools you already have to just break it down. That's all math classes. Um, until you get to more abstract stuff where the whole point of it is not knowing what's going on and then you just have to figure it out anyway. Um, but we're not there yet. So learn the recipes, collect your ingredients, all the instructions. What I think I'll do is I'll compile a file and I'll call it, cha I'll call it chapter 15 exam review. But it's not because there's going to be an exam on chapter 15. It's going to be the stuff from chapter 15 that's going to be on the exam, right? For the 15 and 16. Mm -hmm. So then over fall break, you won't have to stare at your textbook and just go, like, you know, like, what out of this entire chapter am I supposed to be reviewing if I'm going to review them? I want it to be efficient. So I'll, I'll probably, if I have the personal time myself, um, that's debatable. Um, but if I do have it, I'll make, I'll, I'll make uh, like a things that if you're going to do something over fall break. By the way, the answer is yes, you should. Um, and then 
obviously take a few days off, but the time is short. <laughs> it's always worth doing something. You'll feel less useless coming back into this semester again. Um, yeah, I'll make it, I'll, I'll give you like a list of things that you can practice so that it finds you well. <clears throat> yes, that would happen over fall break. Yep, I'm still working with Dr. Harder to get that sorted out. Um, but chances are, talk to me after class because that's it's all being recorded. <laughs> yeah, good time. You know, administrations don't like giving grace. It's kind of unfortunate. Okay. As you said before, let's see. We have, let's see, let's just do, you guys don't need to know that though. I mean, It's all right. No, no. Scott, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay, here's what we're going to do. I'll stop this. 